Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Schroeder. I really appreciate you taking time to, to um, talk with us about resiliency. It's a, a very important topic for us here at Health One EMS. And so I have some questions that I'd just like to get your reactions and your responses to. The first one is these days we encounter lots of jargon and in topics and you know what's the, the flavor of the day in our both our professional and our personal lives. Um, is the concept of resiliency one of these things? Is it one of those flashing the, oh my gosh, here's the latest, just like the latest fad diet? Well, I certainly don't think so. I hope not. Um, when you think about how crazy and chaotic the world's getting and how much more violence and the incidence of stress-related mental illness is all going up, I, I think the idea of our helping one another be stronger is... Uh, I can't think of a more important topic than that. If you look at some of the research, this has actually been looked at since the 30s. Um, and the research really started to take off in the 70s and 80s. And we've learned so much. Probably the most people have been most researched are the military, and we've learned a lot that we can use to help us in civilian life and in our professions. So uh, I, I, this has been called. Uh, the new wave of, of uh, the, the final frontier of psychology, really, and I think it is. I think it's really critical that we, and not just mental health people, but everybody, every parent, every teacher, every kid learn these kind of skills, because life's only going to probably get more tougher, most mm -hmm. would say. I appreciate that perspective, thank you, because for some folks, I think resiliency sounds like it's new, and obviously it is a concept that's been around for a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. And I think we often think of it as being for adults, but I also appreciate the perspective about children because I know in my professional reading, I'm seeing more and more about resiliency in, in childhood and adolescence. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I think like a lot of things, definitions are really critical because mm -hmm. people define this really differently. So the way I've kind of worked it, and you look at the scores of, of uh, definitions that are out there, mm -hmm. To me, it is those inner strengths that are inborn, but we can also develop them, that help us respond well to adversity. And there's, there's really four components specifically to prevent all the bad stress-related stuff, PTSD, suicide, drugs, uh, leaving the job early. Um, and if we experience those things, resilience helps us to recover faster and experience those symptoms less seriously, less severely. But then the other two parts is resilience also optimizes performance and mental health. So that's a big topic, and mm -hmm. it's not something that you know, we get good at quickly. It's kind of a process. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me, because one of the huge topics in EMS these days is, is safety and errors and prevention of errors, and in medicine in general, hospitals, medicine in general. And you can't help but connect some of that back to mm -hmm. the individuals sort of mental state, if you will, and, and their, uh, their psychological status and their resiliency. Because when we're more stressed, we're more likely to make mistakes. When we really mm -hmm. haven't been able to take care of ourselves, I, I think we're really more prone to make mistakes. So it's, um, it has so many implications in, the, in the, the care that we provide. Yeah, I think that's an important point. This isn't just about not being sick. It's about being at our best. And I think for a lot of us, that's kind of the motivator to want to be more resilient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, you flew in this morning, so I'm sure you were hoping that those pilots up in the front of that plane were at their best today, yeah. right? <laughs> right. You've had a wealth of experience researching resilience and interviewing individuals who've had horrific experiences, war veterans, POWs, other trauma survivors. And in fact, you mentioned earlier you had had the, the privilege of interviewing Louis Zamperini about 15 yeah. years ago. Yeah. So you really have talked to some folks who've had really some significant trauma. What are some of the uh, important lessons from these survivors? I think in interviewing these amazing people, you realize how resilient people are most of the time. I mean, these guys talked about officers taking beatings, despair beatings for their the people that they led. And just these character strengths that people demonstrate under pressure, it's, it's really quite inspiring. Um, so that's one major lesson. But the, the follow-up to that lesson is everybody's got their breaking point. And I think Louis is a good case in point. Louis Zamperini endured incredible hardship. The book really only begins to hint at it. But when he got back from the war, he, he broke. His life unraveled. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And so I think even very good copers, you know, we need to know where our, where our limits are and, and know when to call in reinforcements and, and get help. Um, there's so many other lessons. I mean, this is a, these people are very moral, very uh, uh, very strong in so many ways, so adaptable. Um, all of these are the strengths that constitute resilience, and hopefully we can build in each other, um, build these strengths that we have in, in, in embryo form. Okay. I've had the opportunity to review different uh, resiliency materials, take some different courses, and it feels like some of them, the, con the concept is really all about eating right, exercising, getting enough sleep. And those are all very important elements, especially the sleep. I think disrupted sleep is one of the most disruptive things in our lives. Mm -hmm. But um, w those are all important elements. But what does that approach miss? What else is encompassed in really developing yeah. a resilient personality? Yeah, I think you hit on it. I think these are the foundation uh, foundations that are critical and most people have no idea how critical this stuff is. I mean, just the difference between eight hours a night and seven or six is huge. I mean, the fall off in performance and mood is precipitous. So the model I use is um, if you liken the brain to a computer, resilience training is all these wonderful software skills on how to cope and so forth. But the best computer hardware will be slow if the best computer will be slow if the hardware is sluggish. So, um, you know, resilience starts with optimizing the brain hardware, and that's with the sleep and the, the exercise, nutrition, and, you know, certain drugs to avoid and so forth all come into play, and that's critical. But the part it doesn't include is the programming, the software, and that's um, skills to manage and cope with strong, distressing emotions because we're all going to feel them. Skills to get us to happy, because happy people function better, they live longer, um, and uh, uh, leadership skills, leading from the heart. I mean, I, I, I think that's all a critical part of, of resilience. You mentioned sleep. So can you say a little bit more about sleep? It obviously varies based on age, and some mm -hmm. people just, just innately need more, and some people need less. Mm -hmm. um, but say a little bit more about, yeah. sort of by groupings, if you could, what, what we should expect. Yeah, some really interesting Army research found that when people got seven to eight hours, eight hours, they were about 100% efficient, seven hours, maybe 87%. But once you get to the six hour per night, people start firing on friendly forces in schools and hospitals. I mean, we just make more mistakes. And easy stuff, we can still function pretty well, but complex things um, really deteriorates. Um, so the amount's critical. The regularity, getting to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time, which is really a problem for shift workers. And the quality of sleep. Um, you know, blue lights on our computer is an example of something that can really mess up our sleep cycles. Um, so, you know, what do we do? We typically turn to sleeping pills, but there's a hundred things we can do to really get good sleep quality. And like a lot of things, we get away with a lot of stuff in our 20s that we don't get away with after 30. So this stuff is really critical to have good habits starting early because it really catches up. First, it reminds me of charging my iPad. So you really want to get your iPad charged up to 100%. Not that the performance falls off if you get down below, but, yeah. but the amount of sleep is like uh, charging your iPad. And this may be a loaded question, but have you seen anything that indicates for the new devices that like the, you know, whether it's the fitness devices that can measure your sleep, do those really work in terms of determining your quality of sleep? Have you, have you seen anything on that? I haven't. <laughs> I think that would be interesting because yeah. I really wonder, I just don't know, how well that can interpret what, how, you know, y yeah. your sleep. I don't know. I know there are home devices that measure like sleep apnea, mm -hmm. which is, will really mess up your daytime mood and, and functioning. And there are home devices, but I've not seen the research mm -hmm. on how accurate they are. That's a good area to research in the future. Yeah. You touched on this earlier. You talked about innate resilience, that, that which is genetic to us. Um, but we've all probably seen some people who seem to have very little, you know, they didn't get much when resilience mm -hmm. was passed out. Can it be developed? Yeah, absolutely. I think when you look at the research on 
personality traits, just about any trait is like 30 to 50 percent genetic. Happiness, that's the case. It's probably the case with resilience as well. Um, so the way I always look at it, everybody's got the 15 or 17 or so strengths of resilience in embryo capable of being developed. But at 20, you may have developed those much more than I have, or I may, I may have gone through more overwhelming stress and I've been preoccupied and haven't developed those. But I think the point is, no matter what step we're on in this resilience staircase, um, we can go up the staircase. My psychiatric trainer used to teach us that. Um, we can always grow. And so the genetics gives you a baseline, a starting point. But we can ramp up or tamp down that baseline depending upon the epigenetics, which is a fancy way of saying the, the practices we mm -hmm. choose, the attitudes we cultivate. So yeah, I think if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be in the business that I am. But I think we can really teach people to tap into those innate strengths and develop them. But it doesn't come quick and it doesn't come easy, and that's, that's an important point. Oh, but we like things to be easy. Right, we we like them to be quick. Yeah. You've mentioned research a couple of times. What, uh, what's the research that can inform us on resilience? Because mm -hmm. we, we are in the medical field, and we are hopefully uh, looking more and more to evidence-based practice or evidence-informed practice. So there's lots of fads out there, just like I mentioned the diets and other kinds of self-help. Uh, mm -hmm. But we, what's, the, uh, what's the research on resilience? Well, first wave of research looked at what are the factors, the personality traits that separate resilient people from non-resilient people? And there are about 15 or so that come up pretty consistently in the literature. So that's a good starting point, but it doesn't tell you how to develop those strengths. Mm -hmm. um, so the next step is how do you measure change? And there are some pretty good scales now that measure resilience. And we used one at the University of Maryland where we found that put people in a small group and you teach pr people every day, here's a principle, here's a skill, let's practice it, go home and do it for mm -hmm. homework, and we'll come back the next day and say, what worked, let's reinforce those strengths, um, motivate each other, what didn't work, let's tweak. And what we found at the end of the semester, we felt pretty good, but we weren't sure it did work, and so that's why you do research, but we found that everything we measured changed. Resilience changed in a major way happiness, optimism, self-esteem, curiosity, which uh, we sort of threw that scale in, and I'm glad we did because it's, it, it's got a lot of implications for resilience. Uh, but all those improved while anger, depression, and anxiety mm -hmm. all significantly decreased. So I think, again, I think we can change resilience, we can grow it, but it doesn't happen overnight. It happens by applying skills methodically, regularly. Which is very true in EMS when we're teaching skills, like we have students here today who are practicing skills, and it really is about getting to mastery. So right. there's the, you know, I'm going to do this because this is what the book, the paper said to do, um, but then you have to continue to practice. And, and what exactly. we want our, on the psychomotor skill side, we want people to become, um, you know, unconsciously, you know, consciously unconscious about what it is that they're doing. So yeah. that it is just automatic, exactly. and it's like many things in life, practice. Yep, because under stress, you gotta have mastery. Yeah. <laughs> the information alone doesn't get you out of the, the crucible. Yes, when you're learning to play an instrument, um, it takes a lot of practice to get there, and sometimes the practice is painful for not only for you but the people who are around you listening to it. Yep. But exactly. yeah, absolutely. What, how, what do you think the relationship is between how resilient we are and the the incidents of other, um, uh, I almost hate to say disorders, but for post-traumatic stress disorder, for other types of depression, other types that might be labeled as disorders. What do you think, Ben? Yeah, well, here's the bad news and the good news. The bad news is if you take PTSD, 80 or 90 percent of the time there's some comorbid disorder like depression, anxiety, drug abuse, excess. That's the bad news. But the good news is there may be a common mechanism that sort of are common to all of those things. And my feeling is resilience training, when done right, touches on those common risk factors. So you, you not only theoretically help someone prevent PTSD, but they'd also be less likely to uh, uh, use ex excessive drugs or um, 
leave the career prematurely or be domestically violent. So I, I think the, the promise and the hope of, pre, of uh, resilience is the preventive aspect, that if we, if we help each other early enough in our lives or careers that we don't have to deal with those things and worry about fixing the problem later. So I, I love resilience training. There's no stigma. You know, everybody wants to be more resilient. Um, we don't say, well, come into our resilience class because you're depressed or you've got PTSD. We say we're all about helping each other uh, optimize these strengths we all have. And we help each other. We build teamwork as we do it. And it's just amazing what happens when you get people in a group like that. And I will say, when you work with people like the military, cops, medical people, um, you know, that's not usually our experience, and so it's a little resistant, but then you realize, wait a minute, we're building teamwork just like we would as paramedics build teamwork with their colleagues, mm -hmm. or military squads build teamwork tactically. And after a while you go, there's a trust that develops that's even better and richer than, than just, you know, the kind of teamwork we build tactically. And that's interesting because there is literature that shows that improvement in teamwork helps reduce medical errors, especially in places like emergency departments, right. critical care. So that that ability to work as a team and to function optimally really does help reduce medical errors. So it's a, it's a really a rich area to explore. Yeah, and I think once you realize that, wait a minute, this isn't as hard as I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. you know, it's okay to open up a little bit and show that I'm human and you show you're human and we go, well, that's okay. We're going to both work together to get stronger. And everybody wins that way. Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. And you mentioned stigma. And that is huge, especially in the emergency services community, law enforcement, places that we work with. Mm -hmm. Because even the term mental health has a stigma because mental health means you're not well, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. And then it's been changed to behavioral health, which doesn't really do a lot to soften it for people. Mm -hmm. And we talk a bit, and we do critical incident training, crisis training. But people look at me like, lady, I don't have any crises. So yeah. there's that stigma yeah. of I need to be strong. I, right. I, these things don't affect me. And uh, hopefully resilience is, is a more, is a positive uh, for mm -hmm. folks. And that we do all want to continue to develop, not only for ourselves, but for the yeah. people that are around us and our families. Yeah, that's well said. And I, I think once you've been around long enough, you see very, very strong people. And when they can open up and say, you know what, I struggled for maybe a year or two after, uh, I'm going to use the military metaphor, mm -hmm. but, but very good leaders come back and say, you know what, when I finally acknowledge, or my wife finally made me acknowledge that I had a problem, and I got help and I became a stronger leader, you know, I can understand other people suffering better. And you go, there's no shame in not having all the skills. So I, I love the, the metaphor of if you're an athlete and I'm a world-class athlete, I'm going to hire a coach. I may play circles around that coach, but that coach will point out to me what I may be doing wrong. And so it, there's no shame in that, in getting a coach. There's a, the whole uh, discussion now. Do we call it PTSD, a PTS? Uh, disorder, or do we just call it post-traumatic stress? Personally, it's a disorder in the sense that we are out of the normal order. Mm -hmm. And if changing the name helps somebody destigmatize it and get needed help, terrific. But, um, you know, mental health is a beautiful term. Health, not disease. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and, and a disease or a disorder is simply the departure from ease or the departure from order. There's no shame in that because we all get derailed, everybody at times. Once you realize that, that I'm not the Lone Ranger here, that we're in the same boat, and really we're not concerned about stigmatizing, we're concerned about strengthening each other, now it becomes a positive. I really like the coach analogy. I hadn't thought about that before, but mm -hmm. that's true because you may be a better player than the coach, but the coach can see things that right. you don't. And in many ways, that's the same way with therapy. Right. I mean, a good therapist is just, just going to guide you through and ask you some appropriate questions to help right. you reflect and, and to help see. But it, re mm -hmm. it really is about uh, coaching and getting a different yeah. perspective. And we carry that analogy further. I mean, isn't that what a family member or a friend does? Mm -hmm. You know, I love you and I'm, I may see something you're not quite seeing now. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. It doesn't mean you're weak. It's just we're human.
It's and okay that, to be human. I think that's the that's such a huge skill to be able to give that kind of feedback and receive that kind of feedback and be open to it. Yeah. And and I think the kind yeah. of personality that you're talking about that's happy, that's optimistic, that's all of those things is more likely to be open to yeah. that kind of, of feedback and dialogue. Yeah, and some of it is just well, a couple of things that that calls to mind. Part of it is just being confident enough to realize I don't have to have all the answers right now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try my best to learn as much and be my best. But who knows everything? And who knows it all now? So once you get comfortable acknowledging I'm not perfect, then it's safe to say, you know what? I got stressed out the other day. And I can tell you stories of cops and firefighters when they finally got the courage to say to their friends, I was scared out of my wits. And the other guys would say, I'm so glad you said that. So was I. And then you go, okay, let's talk about it. And we go back to work. Mm -hmm. And we're better for it, not worse. In, we talked earlier about emergency service personalities and, and uh, any kind of a, emergency responder. I think many of us tend to feel like I have to be strong. I have to be right. I have to have the right answers. So mm -hmm. I think that, that sets us up for right. having some issues. And it's not about not being strong, it's just about I've got to be, I've got to be right, I've got to do it right. And I wonder how much we train that into people as well. We, we train them to be autonomous, especially in the mm -hmm. emergency services field, because you're out there on your own, you're doing your own thing, and, and mm -hmm. you have to feel like you've got the answers. And so right. we probably don't help some of that by um, sort of the, having that expectation of folks, that they're always going to make the right decision, that they're always going to do it right. That's very insightful. I'm a West Pointer, and I was <laughs> in culture. <laughs> you know, I was bred into us to never make mistakes and yeah. never show that you make mistakes. And personally, I love a leader who will cry at a funeral, mm -hmm. and then they go back to work the next day, and you go, "That's the kind of guy I would follow." You know, they're, I know they're trying their best, but they're not perfect. They're mm -hmm. not pretending to be perfect, but I trust them to do their best, and that's all humans can do. I had the pleasure several times of hearing uh, Captain Al Haynes of the United 232 uh, experience that crashed in, uh, in Iowa talking about what that was like and, and th that whole experience. Um, and that was in the early days of crew resource management, which is now popular not only in the aviation industry and other industries, but also in EMS. But, but that was, and he gave lots of examples of how in the airline industry, the pilot was the word, just sort of like you're talking about with West Point, this is the way it is, don't ever question your judgment. And Malcolm Gladwell also talks about that in some of his books about some mm. of the uh, airline crashes where y you didn't question. And so, uh, yeah, that was, that's the way we've, uh, we, we've approached a lot of things. You know, mm -hmm. we're, I, I can't question my judgment, which makes it more challenging down the road. Yeah, and I think the goal is I'm gonna, set my goals reasonably high to be the best I can, and that's part of resilience. Mm -hmm. But part of resilience is also saying I can recognize where I'm not strong. And it, it's, it's not a stigma to say that to team members, mm -hmm. but we're not going to stay there. We're going to try to build each other. Good. Do resilient people show differences in their neurobiology and biochemistry? Yes. Um, that's a fairly new field of research, but Resilient people are physiologically different than less resilient. I don't want to say not resilient, because everybody's resilient on a continuum. But, but we know there are lots of different differences. Um, if we look at the brain, we can actually teach people to have more activation here relative to this part of the brain. And this is the part of the prefrontal cortex that is associated with happiness and optimism. And we can actually train people to increase that ratio. So someone may start out genetically kind of tending toward depression, but, mm -hmm. but 10 years later you measure their brain and that ratio has shifted. Um, we know there are certain resilience skills that increase brain synchrony, gamma, brace, uh, gamma wave synchrony. Um, the hormones are different, although we're trying to tease that out, but um, certain hormones like, like cortisol will tend people towards dissociation, which sets you up for all sorts of problems, um, and, and medical problems, including not just psychological problems. But um, there's all sorts of changes. Um, and I think what we'll find is as we teach people resilient skills, we can actually measure improvements 
but right now it's still fairly um, uh, early in the in the process. What's the technology that can help measure some of those differences in the brain? Um, there's different kind of brain scans, um, ma magnetic res mm -hmm. resonance imaging, and so forth. Um, there's some incredible research on it. Um, we can show through brain scans that people are resilient, so their hippocampus actually gets bigger, and less resilient people, it either shrinks or it started out smaller. Okay. Um, and I've been to listen to these neuroscientists talk about it. It can be really confusing because this is not a simple <laughs> <No>. <laughs> or, organism, the, the brain, but but now we're starting to see some things kind of emerge, like the hippocampus mm -hmm. is a critical part of the brain, and, and uh, in general, the bigger the hippocampus, the more resilient people are, because the hippocampus has to do with laying down memories in a cool way that can be recalled effectively, um, and it tempers excessive arousal. And we know there are different ways to grow the hippocampus through exercise and good sleep and fish and produce and so forth. Um, but uh, again, the, the research is pretty preliminary right now. So you mean I really do have to eat right and eat my veggies? Yeah, it matters. Okay. <laughs> More than we think. <laughs> Especially as think. we get older. I was going to say with sleeping before that less than seven hours hastens brain aging. So it's kind of another one of those little interesting facts that, you know, we think, well, I'm getting away with seven hours. I'm 28 and I can get away with it. But it, it catches up to most people. You mentioned about like blue lights, compu computers or whatever in the in the bedroom, and, and I've read different things like you should not have any kind of, of uh, device that emits a light. For example, I've got a clock radio that's got a light in it, yeah. or you read on an iPad before you go to bed. You think those things are really that important that we should eliminate those in our environment? They add up, yeah. I mean, all the things add up, right. you know. Uh, in fact, we were just talking about this. My wife and I were talking about this in bed. I mean, she she said, "Oh, let me let me check that for whatever we're talking about. Let me check." And she opens up her phone. I said, "Blue light, blue light." <laughs> so I mean, it's a challenge today mm -hmm. with all the technology we've got. But um, you know, if you don't turn the lights off before ten minutes before you get into bed, and before you do that, you check your emails, and then you check your phone. It's a lot of blue light that tends to disrupt our circadian rhythms. One of the things I wonder about, and being a bit of a news addict, is I tend to have the news on, the late new, late night news on, mm -hmm. and that's just not very nice stuff to try to go to no, sleep it's on. Not, it's not. And I share your pain, because we watch the news too, and, yeah. and a lot of times I'll just say, why don't we turn it off? It's no, not much different than what you heard yesterday. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you know, the world is still crazy, but um, yeah. Yeah, we get addicted to it. I mean, we, we love to hear the news and be able to discuss it, but sometimes we just say, let's turn on something entertaining and uplifting. The other thing that seems to be stimulating before sleep is laughter. So as much as I love things that are enjoyable and fun and like to watch, you know, fun movies or whatever, if you that, that's the last thing you do at night before you go to sleep is, is be laughing at a TV program, I find it a lot harder to try to go to sleep yeah. because the, you, my brain's more active and it feels more stimulating. So we probably yeah. all have to find our own yeah. patterns of what yeah. assists us in sleep and what may be detrimental to sleep. Yeah. I'm, I'm really good at avoiding that exercise before I go to sleep. I don't do that <laughs> Despite the prevalence of television programs and movies that often glamorize the emergency services professions, we often see new recruits and those in our initial education programs that have, well, let's just call it an uninformed view of the road ahead. They think it's going to be like it is on TV. How can we help prepare them for the challenges of the work and how to take care of themselves, how to take care of their loved ones, and how to integrate their experiences into their personal and professional lives? I think uh, in having tried to do some stress education, crisis education, especially with EMTs or new law enforcement academy recruits, they just sort of look at you and again, it's like, well, what are you thinking of, lady? This job's going to be fun. If you've never had those experiences and you only have exposure to what's on TV, I think it's really hard to anticipate how these things are, might impact mm. personally. There's a lot in that question. I mean, I think that's a pretty good definition of resilience in there, being able to help ourselves so we can help others. Uh, you know, just about every high-risk profession, people go in there with blinders on, 
So for example, when I would interview pre-med students, I would say, I want you to read this book about physician stress. You know, nobody ever talks about what's going to be like when your first patient dies when I'm supposed to be the healer. Um, but it, it goes back to t being comfortable talking about the emotional aftermath of stress. Because it's not the technical stuff that uh, traumatizes people. It's the emotional stuff. And those are typically the things that people don't talk about. But once you can sit down with a, uh, an elder or vet and say, tell me really, what are the hard parts about this job? And then you can at least prepare. But it always kills me when a leader says, I don't want to talk about that because it may scare you. And that totally doesn't give a person a chance to prepare emotionally. Emotionally inoculate. Mm -hmm. You got to know what's up, what's coming in order to inoculate to those things. Uh, so there are a lot of parts of that question. Did I, did I touch on all of them? No, that's good. Thank you. It, it triggers a couple things in my head. One of them is mentors. It's in a different mm. context, but mm. we don't probably don't use mentors near enough in our profession. Uh, we use sort of supervisors or field training officers, but not necessarily a mentor who might help you see mm. the road ahead mm. and help you see what those landmines are ahead. Yeah. But I wonder if that's one of the things we could do with our students as well, is as you said, have someone, and in our instructors all have field experience, but to some extent, you know, it may be like my mother telling me, giving me advice, well, that's my instructor, but to have somebody else say, you know, these are some of the things that, this is how, this is a situation that happened to me, and this is how it affected me. And mm -hmm. this is what I did that was positive about it. There's probably some ways yeah. that we could help better prepare folks who truly are uninitiated for what might lie ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know sometimes the action-oriented people are not big readers, but there are books that are in almost every profession that touch on the emotional challenges. And every, every career has mm -hmm. their hazards. Mm -hmm. And once you read it, I trust people to say, oh, okay, now I, can, I know what to expect. Mm -hmm. Okay. We work with emergency services responders in, in our uh, work here that have been on the job for 10 minutes and those that have been in the field for 30 years. Which groups or who do you think is more likely to be resilient? The person who's new and, and you know, maybe younger and enthusiastic or the person who's got a lot of experience? That's a great question. and The depends answer <laughs> is, is thus. Because um, there's a parallel within the military. A lot of times the kids that come in right away, uh, there's a cumulative effect of stress and so the younger people haven't typically accumulated as much. Now that's on average. Um, but they're also perhaps lacking in experience. So you got a kind of a double-edged sword there. I had a Navy SEAL one time tell me that it's usually the older people who will, the older seasoned vets who will acknowledge the need for resilience training and, and even counseling. You know, they've been, they've been in, through enough where they realize what they don't know. So, you know, it's kind of a, a, a mixed bag there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what would be wonderful if we could take that energy and relatively untarnished psyche of youth and, and teach them early in life skills that will help them deal with these traumas that they will face. Not a question of will they, mm -hmm. but when will they? Uh, and then hopefully they're not the ones that burn out or leave their job prematurely. That's interesting. I was having a conversation with an EMS chief, a veteran EMS chief last week, who said, well, I think that we're, as the younger generation, so to speak, are coming in, they're more willing to be open and they're more willing to talk. But I re reflected, it depends, because it mm. feels like sometimes the younger folks are more the, I'm new, I have to be tough, I have to show my stripes versus the person who's been around a while and maybe more willing to open mm. up. So uh, mm. we, we do get stereotypes about which group, if you will, is more likely to be mm. willing to talk and to share or more willing to be open to the idea of resilience than others. But it, it, as many things in life, it depends. Yeah, as we're talking here, I'm just thinking. I mean, I, I'm not arguing for um, uh, people who are not strong. You know, sometimes people hear talking about be kind with people's imperfection. That's not an argument for accepting um, subpar performance. I'm saying be excellent. I think that's 
part of resilience is shoot for excellence, but not perfection. Just realize humans don't get to perfection. We get to very good often. And if we do it often, then we're, you know, with more frequency, we're doing pretty well. That's a very important distinction that I think it probably gets blurred a lot for us because we're all supposed to go to the Super Bowl. And there's a difference between mm -hmm. excellence and perfection. Well, not that I think yeah. that whoever wins the Super Bowl is perfection, but I think that that's an important distinction. Yeah. Good point. You, you talked about early traumas. Um, so do early traumas, especially in childhood, make us more or less resilient? It makes, well, again, the depend mm -hmm. answer is, um, uh, go back to Louis Zamperini. He was an artful dodger. He was very skilled at crime. He was very good, he was <laughs> an excellent juvenile delinquent. Uh, and that actually helped him be more confident because he felt, I can get out of just about any scrape. Um, now, put that in context. They had very loving parents <laughs> who kind of, you know, and a great brother who steered him back to the straight and narrow. So he wasn't overwhelmed by his tough years. And he had some tough things to overcome. He was bullied and beaten by kids because he couldn't speak English. So some tough experience toughens us up. That's why we go to basic training and police academies and fire academies. But overwhelming experience makes us less resistant. And there is mind-blowing to me research that shows that unresolved uh, early childhood trauma uh, sets us up to be seriously traumatized. Sometimes it just takes a little straw to break the camel's psychological back. Um, so I think the key is unresolved serious trauma will cause everything from medical to psychological to functional problems to relationship problems. And, and I say that not to be a harbinger of bad news, but to say if there's unresolved trauma, for Pete's sake, let's get that treated mm -hmm. because it's, it's treatable. And people go through life carrying unhealed wounds that damage their relationships, their job, because they don't know where to turn to get help. And so I think part of the thing I got excited to say, there is good help out there. You may have to search for it. Or you may have to be a good consumer and, and try one person and see if that fits. And if it doesn't, try another coach. But you know, I always remember the general who said, if you're traumatized and, and you're not healed, you're not 100% there for yourself, your family, or your people. So get healed, get whole, so you're fully present. He was a wise leader. He was a wise leader. Very wise leader. So we teach here. Um, it's great to go to a class, and we do a lot of those, or listen to a webinar like this, or read a book on a topic such as resilience, and get enthused about the topic. But then the reality of the day-to-day -day routine sets in. We fall back to our old ways and habits. How can we change that dynamic? You mentioned earlier about the importance of basically repetitive behavior and mm -hmm. basically practicing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's certainly one way to, yeah. to address it. So go back to that brain analogy. So dendritic pruning is just a big word that means when, these, when we learn something, neurons make connections. And when we don't keep practicing, those connections start to shrivel up. So repetition is what keeps those uh, connections strong. And so I wrestled with that too over the years. So I had kids for a whole semester when I was teaching at the university, and it was wonderful because it was constant repetition. But then they're going to leave that class, just like somebody here will leave a class after eight hours or an hour and say, OK, how do I remember this? Um, so what, some of the things we did, we did this at the Pentagon with people, is we said, OK, here's your assignment. Take everything you've learned in this class, review your notes, and come back either to the last class or if we're going to have a, a, a booster session, and, and tell us what you're going to take away from the class, what were the skills that had the most meaning for you, and then what would be your written plan to practice those. So maybe once a week I do this skill, and maybe I do that on Monday, maybe on Wednesday I do this skill. So you kind of commit committed to writing, um, and then you have booster sessions, and you have in-service sessions where you say, OK, Joe, you're in the class. Would you be willing for our, our next in-service booster session to take this skill and reteach it? Or Joe and Sue, would you 
come up with a scenario that would call forth a number of skills and say, what are we going to do before, during, and after? So I think that's a pretty powerful way because mm -hmm. we learn the best when we're asked to teach. Um, keep, you know, lifelong learning, keep a good book on yourself. Hopefully there are a few good ones on resilience now. Um, I think putting it on my Outlook calendar is what's important. If you do, if you, for many of us, if we don't put it in front of ourselves, uh, we, do, we do tend to forget it, and you do yeah. have to go back and, and review and refresh. Yeah. You know, in EMS, we make people you know, recertify. We used to make them test. They don't necessarily have to test now, but they have to have continuing education. Uh, we don't know how effective that all is, but it does force mm. us to go back and relook at some look at look at Just, certain content, yeah. and this is certainly one mm. of those content areas. Yeah, and it's a little bit like like golf or piano. I mean, once you learn it, it's sort of in there. Mm -hmm. But if you don't keep practicing, those skills tend to to wane. So it's part of why I love resilience training. I mean, I get stronger as I teach, and I remember stuff that life gets in the way, and I might have forgotten otherwise. But I think that's part of resilience too, to realize we're not perfect. We gotta keep practicing <laughs> to keep our skill level up. And by teaching it, then you have to practice what you teach. So yeah, yeah it's a good plan. Yeah. Good yeah. plan. It's, it's, uh, it's humbling because you realize I'm not perfect in this either, but I don't have to be because I'm trying. And that really <laughs> led into my next question about is it self-sustaining? I, I, the analogy that comes to mind there is uh, either diets of some type or uh, some type of an exercise program that's a muscle building. Because it's amazing, you can put in a lot of intense work in terms of building muscle, but then when you don't keep it up, it's really easy to lose it. Or people who lose a significant amount of weight, and then it's easy to put it back on. So it's not, it's not the bad news is it's not self-maintaining. You One does have to keep, right. keep revisiting and, and working at it. The good news is yeah. it's easier than exercising or uh, staying on a diet. So yeah, it's it's not hard, it, but it does require work mm -hmm. and, and repetition. And, and go back to the staircase mm -hmm. analogy. It's easier to go down the stairwell than to go up, and that takes energy and effort. But then you get a better view at the top. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's sometimes it, we're not the problem. It's the folks that are around us, our coworkers, our family, our friends. You know, we want to have a positive attitude. You talked about the importance of a positive attitude and optimism. And we want to take care of ourselves and for them to do the same. But sometimes it just isn't happening. Uh, and it's easy to be sort of brought down by other folks. And that's true whether it's coworkers or family or whoever. Mm. So any tips for those situations? Well, a couple of thoughts. I, I think humility is, is a big part of this. Um, I heard someone wise say, every time there's a conflict, there's three points of view. <laughs> there's <laughs> yours, there's mine, and the objective observer. So, you know, I may feel like I'm totally right and you're totally wrong, and the truth may be, okay, I got a, a role to play here. So part is just to realize, okay, maybe I'm not the ultimate answer here. Um, part of it, I think, is we can bring the horse to water, but we can't force them to drink. And, and so I think that notion that the Eastern Masters teach, um, you know, try your earnest best, speak from the heart, and then don't get too attached to the outcome. We've all had family members and we know that things don't happen overnight. <laughs> Sometimes we put out a principle and 20, 30 years later, maybe after it's gone, they go, oh, uh, again, I think Louis Zamperini was a case in point there. His parents taught him some great stuff that mm -hmm. Only later in life did it click in. Oh, very important. Thank you. What's the most effective way to incorporate any lifestyle attitude or behavioral change? You know, sort of the old wi the wisdom has conventional wisdom has been you need to, uh, for example, if you're if you're going to exercise, you need to do it every day for 30 days before it becomes a habit. So there's the thought of what we you know. There's our behavior, and then there's our attitude, and then our values, which I've always found sort of interesting. It's like people who, who smoke, um, you know, and you want to quit smoking. Well, you have to just stop smoking for X amount of time before your attitude changes that I don't want to smoke. And then we all know those now non smokers, pre previous smokers, who are so rabid about smoking. So their whole value system has changed. 
Um, does that sound like a reasonable way to think about it, that how it takes time to change? Not only that we, what we practice, as we mentioned, to mm -hmm. this is something I really value and I, I want to continue to do. There are researchers who spend their career looking <laughs> at that question. <laughs> I'm not satisfied to come up with the answer yet. You don't but, know the magic number? No, but um, I, I will tell you a story about a student I had who came, talking about resilience, very difficult childhood and was all messed up and struggling. And then she had a professor who taught her some coping skills. And I said, what got you to, to get you from here to here? And she said, I decided to commit to it. Now, where, where is that magic point where I say, I want this bad enough, I'm going to do it? Um, I don't know if there's a magic formula, but I think, I think people are smart. If you give them mm -hmm. options, they'll think, this is something I want. Give me the principles. Why do I want this? And how do I do it? Then the stuff we're talking about, the repetition, the skill practice, then it falls into place. But I think, you know, leadership teaching is, is a spiritual element there where it's not just do this and here's the, re here's the payoff, but you're capable of more than what you're doing. I'm capable of more than what I'm doing. And the minute I know that, I think it's half the battle. The word tipping point comes to mind mm -hmm. because for some people, it's wherever you decide to commit. Maybe for some people, there's a tipping point. You know, I'm tired of feeling, you know, having no energy, of feeling down, or feeling depressed, or whatever, and I really want to, I need to do something about it. So probably it's, uh, for some people, it's a tipping point. Yeah. yeah and, or maybe it's an experience that they've had that becomes the tipping point. I've had so many people over the years say, that person just wants, they like to be in pain. They like to suffer. And I, I, I don't know anybody who likes pain. I, I think I know a lot of people who don't know an alternative or way out of that pain. So that's what I think we do is, as teachers, and we're all teachers, we say, here are options. Any of these seem like something you could do? Is there a part of this you might want to try? And I think most people, if they see a pathway that gets them from here to here, they start thinking, maybe I can do that. That's what a good coach, a good mm -hmm. peer, a good friend, a good family member, I think you can do this. I think that's an important part for how we want to incorporate these concepts into our programs. And I'm a firm believer in options and giving people options and not being to say, and this is the magic bullet, you need to do this and you're going to be, you know, you're going to be that. But to say, you know, here's some options because we all have different preferences in terms of what, mm -hmm. what works for us and what we're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So how important, we talked about coping, and how important are some of the relaxation techniques such as meditation, yoga, other forms of structured relaxation? When you say meditation, to most of the people I know, they, there's a lot of eye rolling that goes on because mm -hmm. it seems way too too out there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, until you try it, and then you realize why the research is so <laughs> bullish on these things. Uh, we're using mindfulness meditation mm -hmm. in the VA system. And we find that it helps soldiers with PTSD reduce their symptoms. Yoga, Tai Chi, it all helps to relax. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you just look at it as an incredibly effective uh, exercise regimen that's been around for thousands of years because it's been effective, and once you do it, you realize this isn't so weird. It's just it's just a very effective way to get in touch with my what my body's doing and and um, Yoga, for example, it, it, it's not just calisthenics. It's, it's controlled movements in connection with your breathing, and the breathing can uh, deeply relax people. Um, so usually once people say, okay, I'll keep an open mind, I'll try it for a week or two, they go, yeah, it's pretty good stuff. Mindfulness stuff um, kind of kills me, because when we only have a day or two, I don't have time to really teach it thoroughly. But just imagine for a minute, instead of every time I feel pain, I brace and go, what can I do to kill the pain? Maybe a drink will do it. Maybe an adrenaline rush will do it. Maybe shopping or sex will do it. Um, a lot of those things create more tension and, and avoidance and, and an inability to settle the origin of the pain. So think about what would happen if you could just let that pain in breathe into it in a kind way, 
just like you hold a crying child. You don't say, stupid kid, don't, don't cry. You say, you know, cry until you stop and then you go out to play again. That's, in essence, what mindfulness does. It teaches us a different response to pain. Instead of pushing it away, avoiding, which changes nothing except for the moment, we bring it in until, until it stops hurting and then we're able to go back out to play again. So it is the cell job. I mean, it's not the kind of thing that uh, a cop or a soldier would say, oh yeah, let's meditate. But once you realize it, it's all about connecting to this true happy nature that's already in there, and maybe it's covered up by 30 years of, <coughs> of uh, difficult experience, but it's still there. And it's not that hard to reconnect. Happiness goes up, brain volume increases, electrical patterns in the brain change. I mean, there's a, there's a large amount of science behind this. I can see a lot of people saying, well, I don't have any particular pain or trauma, and that may be true, or at least that they're not conscious of at the time, but I think we always track of how tense we are a lot of the time, and how much we, we hold in. I have a Pilates teacher that's always saying, you know, getting your head out of your neck, and, and then you realize, oh yeah, my shoulders are up here, and you know, I'm just I'm tense for probably no reason whatsoever. So if we can frame it and think about it, that it's not necessarily about a specific incident or trauma right. or pain, it's just about the everyday. You, it's interesting, I uh, have seen several articles just in the last couple of weeks on various techniques uh, that are uh, for the quoting studies, like from the International uh, uh, Society for Traumatic Stress, that have to do with PTSD and yoga, you know, treatments for, mm -hmm. for uh, soldiers with PTSD doing yoga and very positive yeah. results with that, uh, um, for mindfulness, you know, different kinds of meditation as well. And that whole mind-body connection, and we know about it, and we talk about it in medicine, and we talk about it in EMS, but there was an article, a study that was demonstrating a link between PTSD and adult onset diabetes with mm -hmm. folks who didn't have other risk factors like obesity. Well, that's really pretty powerful to think about. And, and we know, we say, it's easy to say, oh, stress and can cause, you know, relate to cancer. And, but something like, like diabetes, which has become so rampant, uh, mm -hmm. and then to be able to, to connect it to that. So a lot of good information out there that we need to stay tuned to. It's a wonder, I appreciate that perspective because, um, yeah, we're talking about PTSD, and that's sort of the extreme right. end of stress. Right. But hearkening back to, like the courses we taught at the University of Maryland, these were these were functioning kids. Mm -hmm. These weren't people in the clinic. These were people who are at a high level of mental health. And what we found is you can actually still increase their level of mental health. And you asked about research before, but mental health in the college years predicts how people fare 40 years later, psychologically, medically, socially, occupationally. So we can be thinking, I'm doing pretty well, but to improve our mental health couldn't hurt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In fact, it might prevent lots of problems down the road. So, right. yeah, this isn't just for sick people. No, absolutely, absolutely not. So I think we all, most of us, want to feel want to feel better. As you said, people don't want to be in pain, but you know, we want to feel better physically, and, and we want to feel better mm -hmm. psychologically and emotionally. We we want to be happy. We want to. Uh, have a positive outlook. So, yeah. for some of the jobs and the professions we do, and we work primarily with emergency medical services, fire service. Uh, we work with law enforcement. You know, are there are there some times when it's okay to quit? We talked about perfection and you know seeking excellence, and we tend to have a mindset: I need to stay with this job. This is who I am. Mm -hmm. This is my profession. Mm -hmm. Sometimes events happen to us. Uh, um, you know, critical incidents, whatever you want to call them that, um, you know, just make us decide that maybe we shouldn't be doing this job anymore, but, but we hesitate to quit. Or in a personal relationship. People mm. stay in personal relationships that are painful and toxic to them. So, um, you know, is it, or should we think that if I'm really resilient, I should just stick with it and, you know, not make a change? Mm. That's another great question. It really is. Okay, so <coughs> resilience helps us be more persistent in a good cause, and that's a beautiful thing. Uh, if you're a soldier in the foxhole and you're trying to fend, 
defend your buddy. You don't want to say, well, I quit. I'm going to walk away. Um, so resilient people can persist longer um, just because we've got all our resources right up there. Um, on the other hand, part of resilience is flexibility. And, and part of flexibility is say, maybe this is the time to tactically retreat so I can fight again. I've known a lot of people that just said, I'm going to hang in here if it kills me, and it darn near does. So I think it's a judgment call. You know, I can stick, and if I have a reason to, I will stick it out. But there may be times to say, okay, this is a good time to um, maybe switch gears a little bit. Our society, I think, uses the term failure a lot. We tend to think in terms of failure. You see that yeah. whether it's in somebody's professional life or personal life, or you think of, um, of uh, you know, you th I think of disasters and oh, these systems failed, and and, and maybe they, they failed. Um, that always seems like a poor approach to me because it's really more about what can we learn from this and do differently. How can we tactically retreat and do something differently the next time? So mm -hmm. to maybe it's, it's wordsmithing, but to me it's a real frame of mind. Yeah, it, it, there's a lot of things that that question pulls in. I mean, so, sometimes it's good to go back to the drawing board and say, you know what, I thought I was pretty strong. Now I got some choices here. I can buttress those areas where I'm not as strong as I thought I was, and maybe I continue down the same path. Or maybe I say, I, I don't see my strengths getting strong enough for me to do this now. So maybe I do something else. Maybe later I come back to it. Maybe I don't. Because there's some interesting research about character strengths, that people get stronger by emphasizing their strengths, not their weaknesses. So a good leader knows that. I'm going to play to your strengths rather than criticize and say, you know, buck up this, this area. So it's a judgment call, but I, I think there's no shame in saying, I'm not as sharp in this as I thought I was. Now what am I going to do about that? It doesn't mean you're a worthless person. It doesn't mean you're incompetent. It just means we're all different skill levels and mixes of skills. So you may be very good at leadership, and maybe I'm real good at following. So mm -hmm. maybe I choose to be a follower. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe leadership is not my cup of tea. That's an important uh, aspect of working with our students or working with uh, providers in the field, focusing on their strengths and building up their strengths. Obviously they have to have certain, you know, minimum skill set and mm -hmm. certain, certain levels. You can't let them go below that. But um, but educationally, sometimes I suspect we focus, and in organizations, we focus on weaknesses as opposed to their strengths. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Burnout is such a popular term, and it's used so widely. Is there a relationship, or what's the relationship between like burnout and, and having a low or poor level of resilience? Do you think somebody's burned yeah. out, if we, if we could actually define what that looked like, would be the same thing as yeah. not resilient? Not very well, again, easy. definitions are probably key here. People define these words differently. But to me, burnout is when you're wiped out and the normal ways that you rejuvenate aren't working. You're just kind of exhausted. Now, that's not all, altogether different from lack of resilience. And some people define resilience as that which prevents PTSD or helps people recover. And getting PTSD, some people say, well, that's a lack of resilience. So I, to me, there's a lot of similarities there. But whatever you call it, I think the skills of resilience equip us to deal in the very best possible way for burnout, for depression, for suicide, for fatigue. You know, all these skills work at any level of stress, and that's the great thing about it. My next question was going to be, how do you recognize your own tipping point, or when the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back? And mm -hmm. I'm sure that's different for everybody, but anything that we should particularly be watching yeah. out for? Yeah, well, I, th I think it was astute that used the word happy. I mean, to me, that's a great opposite of mental problems. <laughs> when we're happy, we're less likely to be depressed, to be angry, to be anxious. So you know what, I'm just, it's not fun anymore, and I can't seem to generate that enthusiasm anymore. Uh, I can't sleep well, I'm irritable, I'm snapping at the kids, kicking the dog, and, and so forth. Maybe I'm turning to uh, drugs to kill the pain because I don't have the resources, or I don't think I have the resources to deal with it. 
so you know those kind of things irritability and uh, uh, fatigue fatigue the big one you know if, if that if that's going up you start stop and say okay what I need to make some adjustments here maybe I turn off that blue light and I, and maybe I take a vacation that was another point about quitting some people think it's a it's a failure to say I need a mental health day or I need to go to the beach for a week I call it recharging the batteries I don't call it failure I gotta have that iPod iPad up to a hundred percent okay here's a loaded question uh, if if beauty is in the eye of the beholder what's the most stressful uh, profession it's also in the behind the eye of the researcher uh, <laughs> so if you ask uh, there is a group and let me remember what the name of the group was uh, career cast and they feed about a hundred factors that make it a job stressful like exposure to hazards and family disruption and travel and pay and security concerns and uh, what they found out was that probably not surprising in some ways firefighters were number one this year although in another survey they were also among the happiest in their careers and happiest with life overall so you know stress and happiness are not always the same um, cops soldiers um, in some years uh, the emergency medical types pop in there in the top ten um, but then if you ask uh, about depression and suicide here's where the health professionals start to really pop up in the top ten physicians typically number one mm -hmm. dentists chiropractors nurses and so forth so I was kind of facetiously say the worst most stressful job is the one you have because everybody thinks their job is is the most stressful um, but things like having a lot of responsibility, lack of control, um, you know, the things I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about my job security, my pay, is my gonna get enough, am I respected by the people that matter to me? Um, those are all things that make jobs tough, any job. Um, we were talking before, I was talking to flight attendants. They pop up really high, which surprised me, but when you talk to them, you go, they deal with a lot of snarly, snarky customers, and, and uh, they've got to be prepared for medical emergency. They never sleep. They're on crazy shifts. Um, terrorism, this is job security, low, low wages, and so forth. So they appear pretty high on that, on that scale. But, but I, think, uh, I think someone working in the, in the medical fields has a good argument that they're the stressful job which is an argument for increasing our coping skills. Mm -hmm. A couple more things. We all tend to get lost in the day-to-day -day of our lives, um, and, and you're just always figuring out what I need to do tomorrow. And even if you're on some type of program, the uh, personal, personal program, personal quest, how do we know if we're making progress to become more resilient? How can we, how can we objectively measure that? If, if one wanted to do that, I'm not sure we need to, but if one wanted to do that. Um, the ultimate test is when we're in the in crisis then we know um, but having said that people perform very differently in crisis so in one crisis you may just shine and I may stink in another crisis maybe I rise and you and you shrink um, because we bring different skills that are good or bad matches to that crisis um, but in our day-to-day, -day, I mean, I think there's some general indicators. Am I generally feeling happy? Do I feel like my life is worthwhile and purposeful and going in a good direction? Am I sleeping well? Am I doing the things I know to keep my brain healthy, like exercise and nutrition and so forth? Um, you know, I think there's a general sense of well-being, and that's part of resilience, too. One of the things, simplest things that I heard somebody say one time was, at the end of the day, just to ask yourself, you know, what was the best thing about today? Uh, or in the morning, what am I looking for today? It's hard to remember to do those things, but it's about looking mm -hmm. for what you're thankful for and, and what was positive. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a yeah. good way to go to sleep tonight. What really worked well for me today? Gratitude's a beautiful thing. And, and sometimes you need to get away from the, the stress of the job to have time to think. Mm -hmm. Again, Louis Zamperini, when he's on that life raft for 47 days, 
He said he realized how noisy civilization is, and he just appreciated the quietude. His mind got clear, he could remember things. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes if we forget to take our foot off the brake, the other extreme is to put the accelerator all the way down. We get so busy, we forget that life ought to be fun. So we got to keep that balance. I was on a tour recently of the Naval uh, Air Museum in, in Florida, and there was a, one of those World War II rafts that was on display there. And I was thinking, having read the book Unbroken, and I was standing there looking at that dinky little life raft and thinking about how initially there were three people in that and like two chocolate bars or whatever it was. <laughs> Boy, it would take a lot to be out on the open ocean with sharks around and be able to appreciate the fact that, you know, there's, the, that it's not noisy, that it's silent. So <laughs> it, uh, we, have to look for, we have to look for the positives, don't we? Yeah, I'll always remember that part where he said there was a day where everything got, the water got glassy, the sky was still, and he just, it was almost a moment of gratitude, like, mm -hmm. thank you for that gift of beauty, which, you know, metaphorically, we get so busy, we mm -hmm. don't see the beauty in other people, or mm -hmm. the work we do, the contributions we make. My, my, my uncle, World War II generation, we were walking around down the street one day, and it was in New York, and somebody in New York, I was looking down, and he said, look at that beautiful moon. And I looked up and said, thank you. I would have missed it. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we need reminders, too. I think that's probably important, too, for all of us, whatever we do, is to think about what contribution did I make today? And and there's pretty much always going to be something to, to somebody, and certainly for our instructional staff here, because they interact with students every day, and for folks in, in out in the profession and in the field. Mm -hmm. So um, there's probably some really simple things. They're not magic bullets, but there's some simple things that that over time might be able to help shift our focus a little bit. Right. And that's part of this happiness research. Little things like gratitude and optimism and uh, meaning, mm -hmm. reminding, what am I doing this for? Do you remember, uh, do you ever see that show, uh, Call a Midwife? Yes, yes. And there's a question that every show starts with that's written out. Why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's really important to remember why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. EMS, there's a reason for why most people go in that. Well, it sounds like there's no magic formula for becoming more resilient, but any final thoughts that you have or things that we haven't had a chance to talk about this afternoon? Yeah, just that we don't have to be a mental health professional to get very good at resilience skills. And then when we get good at them, we can be a resource for people we work with, our kids, our families, people we lead, the people we serve, um, people we try to heal. This isn't jet science. But it does require um, persistence and practice. But so does everything else mm -hmm. that's worthwhile. So it, it, it's a wonderful thing. And I hope that uh, people kind of catch the fire of wanting to be a resilience resource for self and then others. It's a lot of fun. I love it. I, I mentioned about the, the news. And when you watch the news, it seems, the world seems like a, a dark and dismal place, especially if you watch BBC America, where you're seeing all the world mm -hmm. news. Mm -hmm. So there's so much that's going on out there. And it oftentimes can feel very, uh, very overwhelming. And it's easy to lose track of the fact that I think as a as human race, we are very resilient. And I think we can all look at ourselves or at other people who have survived things and, and come through it um, is strong. So mm -hmm. I think we need to give ourselves credit for that and to recognize in this day and age, it's even more important, I think, to be able to keep that attitude mm -hmm. that, that uh, uh, we can be a resource for ourselves and for other people. And now we can draw an external resource. Again, going back to Zamperini, uh, what got him out of the pit he was in when he came back was the spirituality mm -hmm. and the, the faith reawakening. I think as we're getting more materialistic, more secular, that gets downplayed a lot. But that's a very important part of the strength in the World War II survivors I interviewed. Mm -hmm. All of them except one were deep believers. And uh, I was, I'm satisfied that was a big part of their resilience. Thank you very much for being here today. 
it was a pleasure. Thanks for chatting with me. Thanks.